Well, welcome everybody. My name is Matt Hagman. I have the great pleasure of leading Opportunity Miami here at the Miami Dade Beacon Council. Opportunity Miami is, is fairly new. It's an initiative here at the Beacon Council that is the successor to One Community, One Goal that I think some of you may recognize, right? And it's an initiative that's all about very intentionally pulling out of the here and now and trying to think about the next five, 10, 20 years. You know, or as we like to say, imagining the Miami of 2040 when the child today will be entering the workforce and helping our community build it and thinking about what that future, we hope it looks like and what we can be doing now to build that future. And the idea is that this complements Beacon Council's work which is you know, its core work, which is on economic development, driving job creation, recruiting businesses to Miami, building a more prosperous future. And so as part of this work uh, with Opportunity Miami, uh, we've tried to rethink how we go about this and trying to meet people where they are and in different ways. A weekly newsletter that hits your inbox you know, every Tuesday, generally. <laughs> Uh, you know, podcasts, bringing in voices from elsewhere to talk about sort of where we're going and thinking about our, our economic future. Short form video called On Site, where we hear entrepreneurs who are solving problems really critical to our future, which we share monthly. And some of you in this room have actually been featured. And of course, in person events, people want to be with people and having conversations with leaders in our community about where we, what we need to be thinking about, where we should go next, what we should prioritize. Because I think we all know, for those of us who've been here for a little bit of time, the Miami we knew 15 years ago, the Miami we knew 10 years, the Miami we knew five years ago, is a dramatically different place than the Miami today, and the Miami from five and 10 years from now will be dramatically different still. So thinking really hard about what we should be focusing on, where we should be intentional is really important. And with Opportunity in Miami, that's really what we're focused on. And at the outset, we've really hit upon three things that we think are so important. Continuing all the work around driving entrepreneurship and innovation, driving talent and inclusion, and next quarter, working with our university presidents and our superintendent of schools, we'll be um, sharing community-wide talent development goals. And then the third thing that perhaps Opportunity in Miami has been most identified with in this first two years is really seeing climate and the transition to a net zero economy, the decarbonization, decarbonization of our economy, is really being the business opportunity for a lifetime. And Miami can be a global tech hub and be a global tech leader, and really Miami owning that future, as, as that continues to be really not only something that's imperative for our world, but an economic driver. So with that, we of course have someone who I think it's hard pressed to think of anyone uh, who has more shaped our future and is better suited to shape our present and better suited to, to talk about so as we think about where we go next. And that's what this conversation is going to be all about, the future, the future of the future of journalism, the future of arts, the future of philanthropy, and of course the future of Miami. But before I introduce this person who really needs no introduction to this group and someone who's been so important in all of our lives, I first want to, to say a couple thank yous and acknowledge a few people. One, of course, is a big thank you to our sponsor, Career Source South Florida, and Rick Beasley. Rick is going to, to uh, he's going to try and join us today. We hopefully we, oh, it's, we have Cy from Career Source right here. So Cy, we're so happy that we're so happy both of you are here. Thank you and so appreciate your support. It really it means everything. JC Lascano, our chair of Miami Dade Beacon Council and our founding co-chair of Opportunity Miami. We so appreciate you being here, thank you. JC runs American Airlines for Miami, Latin America, and the Caribbean. So when, when uh, your flight's not on time, <laughs> 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 and Alberto was on the board of American uh, for, for, for many, many years. And then of course, want to acknowledge our other co-chairs, Christine Barney, and Miami-Dade County Mayor Daniela Levine Cava. Those are other coaches of Opportunity Miami. I'm so grateful uh, for their leadership and their participation as we joined with them in this experiment of trying to, to build a platform that is solely focused uh, on Miami's future. Before we get started, I'd just like to, to, to hand the microphone over to our CEO, Rod Miller, who came on board about eight months ago now, nine months ago. To welcome you all, we're so thrilled to have Rod leading Beacon Council, and it's so much fun to be working with you as we push Opportunity Miami forward. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm 
exciting. I'll stand up. It's fine. This is a great, exciting day. Thank you, Mr. Bargman. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, uh, as it was mentioned, he really needs no uh, uh, introduction. He's a, uh, been a leader in this community for a very long time and a national leader as well, so we're glad to have him, him here at the Beacon Council. We're also glad to have all of you. Uh, the Beacon Council is the county's economic development public-private partnership, and so our job is to grow the economy of Miami. And, our, and we're not just trying to grow the economy. We're trying to grow it in a way that's sustainable, that's inclusive, and that's competitive. So sustainable from the perspective of both the right industries and predictability in business, but also sustainable from the built environment perspective. We want to grow an economy that's inclusive, whether one lives in whether one lives in South Miami or whether they live in Hialeah or whether they live in Miami Gardens. They should be able to participate. And one in black, white, veteran, disabled. Everybody needs to participate. Everyone that's not participating in the economy represents a loss in terms of our ability to perform. And then ultimately an economy that on the face of it is just better tomorrow than it is today. So how do we push on those big things that make our economy more attractive, whether it's transit or the issues of environment? And before I sit down, you know, I want to say that all of you are now engaged through the Be through Opportunity Miami with the Beacon Council. We encourage you to get more engaged. Opportunity Miami is one of the core cornerstones of our work as it, while it's not, our core work is okay, we've got to attract businesses today. But quite frankly, if we're not thinking about the future, we're lost in the sauce, as the same goes. So um, we really uh, you know, appreciate Matt's leadership in terms of driving Opportunity Miami, and I know we're going to have a great discussion today. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Rod. So we're going to, Rick, welcome. The person who I was just, Rick, we are just talking about you. So and thank you so much for your support. So we're going to talk a little bit, and then uh, uh, we're going to turn it over to you, and so to have a discussion. So please be thinking of your questions. So Alberto, as we sit here, this is Alberto Barton, in case you guys. Um, <laughs> so um, we're a couple weeks away. Uh, a couple weeks away from uh, when you step down. Uh, from the foundation, but ceremonies uh, tossed to the side. <laughs> <laughs> and and of course, this was a journey that started in 1995 when you arrived here uh, from New York City, you and Susanna, uh, to first lead on the Mabo Herald, and then the Miami Herald, and then of course Knight Foundation. And just on a personal level, so grateful I've had the opportunity to to work for you both at the. The, the Miami Herald, and of course at Knight Foundation, where we had a wonderful six years. And neither, and, and you still haven't understood that you didn't work for me. I'm correct. You don't say that. I worked for the Miami Herald. If I had Jack Knight's money, then I would definitely. True story, you guys, and particularly for those who are new in town. I had just gotten here, and uh, my uh, girlfriend, my now wife, then girlfriend, Danette, who is sitting right over there. Uh, we were at a reception, brand new in town, and uh, an Alberto publisher of the Miami Herald, and went up and started talking, and Alberto could not have been more engaging and wanted to, 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 to talk, was open to talking. I'll watch, sorry guys. For the, uh, and uh, and I, he, he walked away, and I turned to Danette, and I said, yes, this is my opportunity. So followed Alberto and said, uh, Mr. Hardwin, I want to come work for you. And uh, and he, you had the best answer. You said, "Let's get to know each other." And uh, one thing led to another, and then you set the Herald for eight years. And I didn't learn because the, then then we hired you at Knight Foundation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, and that's actually sort of in our discussion about the future of in 2012. Joined Knight, sat down. You said, "Go talk to people for four months, and come back and tell me what's next in Miami." and what we should focus on in Miami Night Foundation. And I remember it was in your office, February of 2012, and sat down, and you said, okay, it's been four months, what's it gonna be? And, uh, and said, well, I wanna launch an initiative around building a tech community in Miami. Right? You're nuts. And you, you said that, and it was... Uh, I said more than that. You <laughs> said, yes, no, it, yeah. It was, these conversations could be, Alberto, as you can imagine, I mean, this particularly new in the role is, I remember sweating, and it was just, you know, but, but you were willing, as ever, an open mind and willing to think about where we could go next. And, of course, we launched the whole program, and now we have things like, you know, people go to Emerge Americas every year, Endeavor, gatherings at the Idea Center. All were funded out of that whole program and that work together. 
And you know, and that came from a decision about thinking about where we go next, what should we prioritize. Um, and then we put other things too, I mean, underline, give Miami Day, those are all things. I remember sitting together deciding that these are things we want to fund and really make reality. So what's next, right? And so I think in, as we think for this conversation around what's next, I want to divide it into four areas, as I mentioned. Let's start with journalism, then we'll turn to the arts, talk philanthropy, and then talk Miami. I, I do want to say first thanks. Yeah. Uh, and I want to remember uh, somebody that some of you may have had uh, the privilege of knowing, and I, I certainly consider it that, uh, and that's Jay Molina, who started, uh, who started uh, one, community, one, goal. one Community, One Goal. And he started it really against the tide. He, he, it was not anything anybody thought we needed. The people who, were, who, had organiza who ran organizations were already running their organizations. Everybody who was in politics, who was in business, and Jay was the one who thought there needed to be uh, something that brought people together. As the publisher of a newspaper that I think whose main contribution, it seems to me, was and continues to be, uh, to give, to feed the middle, to give people the information about what's going on with a goal almost never reached of getting it exactly right. Um, and it's almost never reached because it's, a, it's an imperfect kind of activity. It's a, and we are imperfect as humans and that's why almost every day there are corrections in the paper. Because uh, we're still, even the day after the story, we're still trying to get it, get it right. But it is told with a goal of a full, accurate, contextual search for truth, as opposed to here's the view from the left or here's the view from the right, which begins as an argument, as opposed to beginning with we are all in Miami, we have this incredibly uh, diverse um, city, and it is, it is diverse, but it's not diverse because of much we did. You stick the peninsula out into the Caribbean, and you're going to be diverse, um, in case you hadn't noticed. And, and so don't, don't get repetitive stress injury congratulating yourselves on being in a diverse place. Inclusion takes work. Inclusion when some when, when you have a look look at this crowd, that when you've got people who come with this, the, the with the kinds of backgrounds that that people have and and the and backgrounds meaning ideological, racial, gender, um, uh, ethnic, um, uh, of, of every of every sort, then you've got to take into account how do I actually respectfully engage people who have a different perspective, who have a different um, point of view. That's the, that's the job that we have before us. Uh, I actually think that Miami does a better job of that than many other cities. We work, as you know, in, in 26, where the Knight Brothers had newspapers. I think Miami, especially for a large city, does that better than most. Um, but we, as usual, do it loudly. And, and people notice. Uh, and so they say, oh my God, look at those crazy people in Miami. What are they doing now? I say, yeah, and what are you doing in, I won't mention the other city. Uh, but we're, we're at least trying to deal with it. And I think it's, a, it's important to have um, this kind of opportunity to, uh, to discuss. I also need to say that this room is full of conflicts for me. Uh, American Airlines, I love. Um, I, I was on the board for uh, for ten years. I have three MBAs from being on that board. I was on the traditional board. I was on the board that went through bankruptcy, and I was on the board that that uh, I was uh, two of the people from the old American who survived into the uh, the new um, uh, American. And JC, it's always great. To see you, the Miami Herald is represented here by several people, uh, and and, uh, and I think that's uh, always always good. Uh, Danette is with the realtor that uh, Knight Foundation has used uh, so much and done a great job for us. Uh, New World Symphony, uh, ICA Miami, obviously Knight Foundation. AJ D'Amico works with me at the foundation, and Pam as well. Uh, it's it's just I, I, I hardly go any place uh, 
you get you get to a point where you hardly go any place where you where you can't say that uh, oh yeah you remember when we and ten years ago and five years ago and so my favorite intern of all time, uh, Danny. Villoch is here, <laughs> and that's a lot of interns. <laughs> I got it. That's a high honor. And, and, uh, and Abby Chase, who puts together 103 uh, conferences for Knight Foundation every year. Uh, you're all just wonderful friends, and I really sincerely appreciate being here. As to the future, who the hell knows? <laughs> uh, there, there's our conversation. <laughs> One, one, of, one of the things that was so great about coming to Miami, though, uh, and I, I, I was first um, uh, publisher of the Spanish paper um, that was at that time, this is 95, actually. 95 you came. Yeah. Right. Um, and that was, uh, it was an insert inside the English paper. And I love coffee and the stronger the better, and so I drank coffee until I felt electric. Uh, and I noticed that, that you've got to pay attention to the market. And this is really not unlike the conversation you and I had yeah. when you first came to work at Knight Foundation, for the foundation, not for me. <laughs> and, and you've got to pay attention to what's happening in the market, and I would go around to every coffee stand I saw, and I would see that people were taking the Spanish paper out of the uh, out of the English paper, which cost 35 cents, but had a barcode on the outside. So my genius colleagues thought we were controlling circulation. We weren't controlling circulation, because the the kiosk owner or the cafeteria owner would sell the Spanish paper for 25 cents, uh, keep, keep the quarter, and return for credit on the 35 cents of the Miami Herald. Entrepreneurship. And, I, and, I, and it's entrepreneurship, and it's also market research. <laughs> yeah. And so I came back, I said, this, the, you know, we're getting, this isn't working. I said other things as well. Uh, but this, is, this isn't working, and that's how, that's how we ended up. Uh, and that's how we ended up splitting or began, um, splitting the paper, which just by the very act of splitting them allowed advertisers to go directly to the customers they wanted. Uh, it saved an incredible amount in production and news. We were writing to two very different communities that happened to share the same geography, and by our insistence that you had to have only one uh, one one view of the world, um, we were antagonizing people and we're not serving them. We, we, were, we were trying to make them jump through hurdles to use our product. It was a, it was a lesson I, I never forgot. And when we were at the foundation, I had said from the beginning, I don't want, I have no interest. It's not that charitable isn't good if I give money out of my own pocket, and it's none of your business where I give it, and it's and and that's it. And I give it, and I'll have my reward if I ever get one somewhere on the other side. Uh, but that's not what Knight Foundation is for, and what we're for is to run a social investment operation. And so as social investors, we want to have sustainable businesses, we want to have a return, the return can't be money, because then you really get in touch with the IRS. Uh, so the, the return can't be money. It has to be in, in, um, in impact. It has to be in, um, in something, some kind of com uh, community change for good. And you can't do that well, it seems to me, if you're sitting in an office and saying, you know, so what do you think? You want to do this? You want to do that? Yeah. We'll, we'll put out a notice saying we've got a million dollars. Anybody want to do that? And then the million dollars is over, and so is the project. No. What I, and what I said to you was go out and find out what's not being reported, what's, what, what are the underlying trends, and then when Matt came back and he said tech entrepreneurship, I said, what the hell do we know about tech entrepreneurship? It was essentially yeah. zero. Right. And you said, but we're not going to be the tech entrepreneurs, we're going to help create the community 
that welcomes tech entrepreneurship and then stay flexible after you had already left, I remember when at one point we, there was a dinner that Nico Berardi put together with a bunch of uh, people who had actually, I think the average time in Miami at that at that dinner like was maybe months. Two, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You know, it was actually more like a year and a half. And people who had had exits everywhere and were they were really glad to be here. Uh, but one guy said, "Look, we drank the Kool Aid um, and we uh, brought, brought the company down." We're here, I really like it, but I need engineers, uh, and I can't find it. And I've got, every time I go to hire an engineer, I've got to recruit engineers someplace else, and maybe their spouses will like it, maybe they won't like it, and they're this and that. And so I said, so what are you saying? He said, you guys ought to fund engineering. And so we now have our name on the School of uh, Pro uh, Computer, Computer Programming at yeah. Computer Science. At, um, FIU. at FIU, and we've been funding engineering at, at uh, the University of Miami, and we've been funding engineering. All of this, by the way, all of it matched or super matched in the case of FIU, matched by IBM in the case of Miami-Dade College, matched by some other donors at the University of Miami. And that, it seems to me, is the, is the way to approach mm -hmm. uh, philanthropy. And adaptability, you talked about being so important. Okay, so let's, let's go through in, in terms of we think about your past 18 years at Knight Foundation, and we're going to spin this forward. But you've been, Knight Foundation has picked the biggest funder of journalism in the country, journalism initiatives. Uh, I think we'd all agree, i say this as someone who's at the Miami Herald for eight years and have other help. And then, right, exactly. <laughs> Jane's been there a little, little you know, for a bit, yeah, a little bit longer. The, um, but I think we would all agree that local news is a shadow of its former self. In fact, we have news deserts across the country. And you've talked about how this presents a real threat to our democracy. And as our community thinks about its future, as our community thinks about the Miami of 2040, as others do, one of the things we definitely need to solve for is how local news is delivered, how it's consumed, how we think about the problems that we confront and how we should address them. So really at the heart of it is this challenge around local news talk to us and try to, you know, let's let's put ourselves in the future, next 10 years, next 15 years from now, about what do you hope this looks like? What do you think it looks like? There have been experiments around nonprofit news. There are experiments right now in for-profit news. Think about Axios, how they've expanded to multiple markets. What do you, talk to us about this path um, and actually rebuilding local news in communities across the country and what you hope it looks like? Well, I, I, think it's, I think for democracy, it's a train crash waiting to happen when you don't have the basic agreement on basic information about the community. I think I was talking to somebody earlier today. I'm, I'm going to be talking to a group of Jewish philanthropists in, um, in a couple of weeks, and what I'm basically going to say is none of you people are funding journalism. All of you people should have it as if, if Jewish causes are the first... Uh, are your first priority. Journalism should be the second. Why? Because the level of mis and disinformation that is going on about events going on now in the, in the Middle East is skyrocketing. And one of the reasons it's skyrocketing is that people don't have a base for, for, uh, for judgment, for comparison. You've got essentially um, a, a technology that allows you to have, a th that allows you to access authority for any cockamamie uh, idea that you might want to uh, that you might want to think about, and you'll find it. You'll find it immediately. There's somebody that writes. It turns out it's somebody who's sitting in their basement writing. You know, whatever, whatever, whatever comes to mind. They may they may look like journalism. It may be in the style of journalism. It may even have the font of, uh, of most newspapers or or the or the quality of uh, of some television uh, video. But it isn't. It's an opinion, and they're entitled to their opinion. But it's presented as journalism. So I think. In a group like this, I, I just always want to step back and say, if you don't know who's taxing you, if you don't know who's educating your kids, if you don't know who makes the decisions about traffic, who makes the decisions about the environment, 
you're making a huge mistake. We're collectively making a huge mistake because I guarantee you, you don't know. And how do I know? Because I, I, I ask people all the time. They have no idea and no idea what the issues are. So I think except in the world in which you're in the, the world in which you're living, virtually or, or physically, uh, but not in anything that encompasses the economic uh, and social uh, area that we consider to be our overall community. We have stopped feeding the middle. Uh, we fund a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, surveys, in fact, AJ's in that in that department at the at the Miami Herald, and one of the things that I've, that uh, that I've insisted on is that we report any any set of opinions in three buckets. We were reporting only the almost clickbait news, saying the left says this and the right says that. Well, that's you know nothing engages more than anger, and so you hear this extreme on one side, you hear the extreme on the other. But the bulk of Americans, or the or at least as many Americans, are in the middle. I would venture to say most of the most people this group in this room would fall into that category, and we tend not to we tend not to write for them. We tend not to feed the middle. Not even very often uh, to recognize that it exists. And what happens? What happens is George Santos in uh, in Long Island. You well, have there was no local there. press to cover. It wasn't until after he was elected. But that there, there, there was a little bit of a, there was a little bit of coverage, but it, it, but in a but in a publication that was so small, didn't that it, it didn't have the yeah. distribution. And so the guy says his mother died in 9/11. He's rich. He has. A business background. He has. He's Jewish. He's this. He's that. And it turns out all of it, was, all of it was fake. I don't really care what his opinions were. I really do care that there was nobody saying, "Hang on a second. That's just not not the case." It's, and some folks have, have said to me, "Well, it was the job of the other party to get that out." Well, maybe that we have a. You know, we have that. That is what the. Ele the electoral process should have done, but traditionally, there's something called the fourth estate, and that was that was tr that is the traditional role uh, of news media to be to be a, an all-purpose pest, uh, so that so that if you make claims, if I make claims running for office, then I should be uh, asked, I should be challenged. You should you should expect. Um, that there is that function being performed in the community. So here in Miami, as we think about the, the future, though, should we be thinking about, do you hope to see more startups and nonprofit news? Do you think anybody has the answer? Let me just talk. So do you think lots of experimentation in lots of different areas? We've spent, we've spent so far th about $300 million in the last four or five years. Right. We've, we've committed uh, another 300 were part of a of a, a of a group called Press Forward that uh, that's led by the former chairman of uh, Knight Foundation's board, John Palfrey. He's at uh, he's now at the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, that'll be I, I think that'll actually reach a billion. They're at about 650 million in commitments, and all of that is to fund experiments. All of it online. Remember, this is there's this didn't just happen because people got neglectful. This happened because the world changed, the the technology changed, and as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, <laughs> if the if the fans don't want to come to the ballpark, nobody can stop them, and the fans the fans moved to another ballpark, and so there we were, continuing to put out a really good product to a ballpark that was that had. Fewer and fewer and fewer uh, fans in the in the park while they were all over there looking at clickbait. Uh, I just, by the way, quit TikTok for the third time. I, I just I can't, and I, so I, I say that to you, and that's literally true. I I want it. I want to be there. I want to understand it. I want to feel it. I want it. I can't. Uh, I just, so so I just so I, I. But I really do think it's important. And I had this discussion last night with some people who are putting together the, the 17th, the 18th version of the Night Media Forum. I think we should have TikTok influencers uh, at the at the Night Media Forum, talking about how they create 
engagement with their audience. We are still in an experimental stage. And the, the person I was talking to uh, was, uh, was actually Rebecca, and she said, but that, that cute little boy who does stuff about Puerto Rico, I said, I don't care if he's cute, and I don't care if it's about Puerto Rico. I do, though, get a care that he has millions of people yeah. who follow him. The young woman who just graduated from the University of Miami, uh, whose name I can't remember. Um, Alex Earl. Alex, Alex Earl. Alex Earl. I watched her videos. They are fantastic. She really cares about how about my skin. She gives me tips on how to look more beautiful. <laughs> and, and, uh, and this is, and I'm telling you, I know it's too late. I know it's too late. So, but, but nevertheless, I really like the fact that that she cares, and that's that's what you want. I I always wanted. The, the, when somebody walked by an honor box, which is this box for those of you who are too young to know, where you put in yeah. 35 cents and you got a wonderful Miami Herald, or 25 later and got a, a no Herald, I wanted, when you saw that box and saw the front, the, the top, the above the fold front page, all I wanted you to think is to, to instinctively put your hand in your pocket, pull out 35 cents, and pick it up and say, this newspaper is written for people like me. If you do that, you've got a successful operation. We're still, we're still experimenting with whether to do that with not-for-profit uh, organizations where the, the profit that comes back is, goes into the business. No not-for-profit organization, I think, is yet viable because no not-for-profit, and we fund almost, we fund hundreds. Almost all of them. Well, well the maybe best. not, we, we fund hundreds. Yeah. But we haven't, we're only just beginning to have regional alliances, and nobody yet has a national alliance. And you have to have a national alliance because the, the nature of the technology, it's, called, it's not called the World Wide Web for nothing. Uh, the, the nature of the technology um, is not, does not respect geography. So the big advertisers, in order to be able to use you, are not going to do one tiny town at a time. They're going to do one U.S. buy at a time, or one maybe regional buy. Um, but advertising is absolutely not dead, and if you think it's dead, explain to me how Google and, and Facebook and the others who deliver eyeballs uh, are able to to have such wonderful businesses. So it's, but, but the stage we're at is where people are still just experimenting with online, not-for-profit news, online some online for-profit, and and still, most of in almost every town, the biggest uh, news operation is still the online version of the traditional newspaper, sometimes of the, of the broadcast television, but, but mainly it's still the online version. And, um, and that, I think, is a problem because you've got companies that have mind share that is absolutely split. I proposed to my board that we should buy McClatchy. When, I remember. When it was up for sale, and one of the things I was going to do was to immediately, not immediately, but uh, my, my, my proposal was we buy it, we, uh, we spend, it was going to, it was, well, it doesn't matter, that was the amount of money. <laughs> it, it, it's only money. And, and, uh, and, and we were going to add to the technology, to the technology, because frankly, McClatchy's online experience sucks. Uh, it, and I know you agree. <laughs> you don't have to say anything. Uh, it is. It's. It's. It, it. It's not about the reader. It's about pushing, pushing, pushing all the time. So add to the technology. Add to the staff that is only online. Redesign the thing for online rather than still more thinking about the paper. Rather than having the most senior people in the in the room are thinking about designing a news paper, not a, not, a, not a news product, not thinking about how to tell serious stories using TikTok, using um, uh, Instagram, using whatever. And while that is happening in newspapers, it is still happening, within, I think, in tension 
with people who are designing the paper and still, by the way, making money yeah. printing paper. And my plan was at nine months, we also have a reserve, we had a reserve of 40 in the plan of $40 million for the money we were going to lose in that year and a half uh, before we stabilized by stopping printing. We would stop printing and then everybody in the company, everybody in the company would have the same thing as, as, as uh, you and I have talked, Howard, in, at New World Symphony. Everybody is focused not just on the concert we're presenting, but on the concert that we are streaming. And when that happens, it seems to me, then we begin to have a model that might be sustainable. So return to arts, but I think it's fair to say that for this group, uh, number one, that news and information critically important for a community's future, and that this future is going to be built on a lot of experimentation. And and all and on digital. And and and, and it's digital. digital. Okay, let's talk arts. Over this last twenty years, we've been through really a remarkable period. Uh, I mean, shoot, you think about what, 06, where we had uh, the launch of the Arts Center, uh, 2011, New World Center, with a, with a, a concert hall included, as, most prominently. Included before it was the Arts Center? Before it was the Arts Center, just for the record. I don't want to leave that out. 2000, I know, let priorities. The, um, 2011, we had New World Center, and Howard Herring, the CEO of New World Symphony, is here, and selfishly proud board member of New World Symphony. The uh, we had the Moss Cultural Center uh, uh, in 2011, which was the South Dade Cultural Center initially. Pan 13, Frost, ICA Miami. Alex Gartenfeld is here. In 2017, Rubel in 2019. I mean, this is, I mean, in most cities, that's a couple generations of arts institutions, right? And I didn't even catch them all. It's almost like every other year seeing a new arts institution open its doors, and Knight Foundation was either the, the, the second biggest or the third biggest in each one of those cases. And of course, let's not forget, too, this community made a decision in 2004 with a general obligation bond to invest, you know, some four hundred and fifty million dollars of taxpayer money to the arts, right? So, and really, in Miami Beach, uh, in Miami Beach, and Beach just passed a year and a half ago, supporting its cultural institution. So, it's a way of saying how our community has been so intentional about supporting the growth of the arts, right? And particularly supporting arts institutions, building their homes, the places where people go. Let's spin it forward. What should be our priorities for the next 20 years as we think about the arts community? So again, it's, it's something that was already happening. Nobody sat in an office and invented that. Um, we, we already had uh, an important film festival that was actually, uh, that had more foreign film, I think, than, than most. Uh, we already had a, uh, the third biggest um, uh, book fair in the country. It's now, I think, the biggest. Uh, we already had uh, Art Basel, and why did they come here? They came here, f first of all, the geography, the time of year, uh, it fit their their needs. But they got they they came here because there were collectors, and and because this is the meeting place. It's, we're not the capital of any, we're not even the capital of Florida for Pete's sake, but we are <laughs> we are absolutely the best meeting place um, in the hemisphere. Uh, and they came here for that, but they also came here because there was this amazing, amazing set of collectors. Um, people who made a ton of money doing something else and had some form of artistic bent um, that wanted to be expressed in some, in some fashion, and they started collecting, and there are major collections in this. You're talking about uh, Norma Brain, and Nira Rubel. The Margulies, Mar 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 and so on. Yeah. Uh, Jorge Perez now, uh, but yeah, all, the, all those people. And, and it was already, already started, and so our contribution was, uh, the strategy was, will be the second or third biggest funder of the arts institutions that are going to offer art and culture year in, year out, week in, week out. You can go to the ICA any day of the week, I believe it's free, uh, admission, 
<laughs> okay, five days a week. <laughs> Alex has decided to take date a couple of days. Alex, is, Alex, <laughs> raise your hand so you know, there's and, Alex. And, and and so th this is so you so you have to stabilize those institutions. Somebody else will come in with a naming with a naming gift and so forth, and then to be the biggest funder of grassroots. So about a third of our budget, although it gets most of the press, about a third of our budget really has gone in. Uh, and this is a we've invested 220 million dollars over the last 15 years in in arts and culture and events in uh, in Miami. The 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 uh, the grassroots stuff really makes a lot of noise, gets a lot of attention, makes people think, hey, we've got a community. People are doing this. Uh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? No, I couldn't go. I went someplace else. That's exactly what you want. And do it in a way that is sort of bumpered by geography so that it really has, uh, has impact. And so our focus tended to be um, in, the, in, the, in the downtown area. We've done some stuff in Broward, some in Monroe, some in West Dade, and so forth. But it's been mainly and intentionally uh, a downtown uh, kind, of, uh, kind of project. I think, it's, I think it worked mainly because there was already the, 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 you remember when there were these things called records? Uh, the, the, so the record labels had their Latin America offices here in Miami. This was already the place where that stuff would tend to happen. So there's nothing genius about saying, oh, this is happening. I could have had a V8. So let's, let's just go ahead and, and fund to, to leverage or accelerate the trends that are, this is a, a really basic Malcolm Gladwell kind of, uh, kind of insight. You, you have these underlying themes that come together and create a tipping point. And I think that's the, the, if we did anything that had any insight, it was in realizing that there were all these things that were happening at the same time uh, that had really not connected with each other, but that could be uh, leveraged, accelerated, and helped to explode. And that, I think, is exactly what happened. Are there things that come to mind, though, as we think about the Miami of 2030, Miami 2040, that you think that this group to be intentional about as we think about sort of the next chapter? in our arts community. I think there, there are, there, like everything else, there, there are lots of things to, uh, uh, to consider. We, we now have about 60% of our arts budget is in digital programs. Uh, we had zero when we started out. Uh, why? Because for the same reason. Where's the crowd? Uh, if the crowd is digital, you want to deliver your product uh, where the crowd is going to be, where, where, the, where the crowd wants to be. Um, and I think adjusting, organizations adjusting to that um, is, is, uh, is, is simply not easy. I think ICA does some of the absolute best uh, use of, uh, of digital media in their, um, in, their act, in, in their arts activity. New World Symphony, I think, is, a, is a, literally a world leader uh, in, uh, in that. And yet, as you and I have talked, the field hasn't followed. Uh, the field is still saying, "Come to the concert hall, and then you'll hear um, the the symphony." It's a different experience. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. But what I, I don't know. What I do know is that the crowd tends to think of itself um, as a as uh, as a group of people who will who will uh, enjoy whatever it is, music or 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 video or theater or whatever. Uh, online, and then there's the supernova, uh, Beyonce, Taylor Swift, uh, that will have the that will change a town's economy by a physical event. So there's still that. Uh, what is that? How does that play for us? I don't know. Um, I think I think taking account of the technology that is that is that is a new tool. It's a new paintbrush. It's a new, it's, it's when radio was first introduced, when, when uh, I don't know, when they switched from uh, oil to acrylic. Uh, mm. these, are, these are different technologies that we simply have to be flexible enough uh, to take into account. There's this, so there's, there's that. There's affordability. We have a very, we have a comparatively small creative 
uh, class in, in Miami, and I think a lot of it has to do with affordability. It's the, same, it's the, it's the middle class curse of all, of all business in Miami, of, of trying to run businesses that are profitable in a, in a place where the, the cost of living is as high uh, as it is here. That, that squeeze is happening in every part of Miami, and there's no reason to think that the arts aren't going to be um, uh, affected by that. And I think there's also the the uh, the, uh, um, the 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 environmental issues that um, <laughs> that affect everything. Because it, if you're if you're washed away, I'd look, ask anybody from Puerto Rico who tried to do anything after Maria. That's about as good an example as I can think of of what happens when the entire community is just simply, I mean, is, is, it feels wiped out. We, we actually uh, paid for uh, a couple of years for something like 200 kids from Puerto Rico to come here to, uh, to FIU, to Miami-Dade, St. Thomas, and uh, University of Miami, and in talking with all of them, the, the, the feeling was, uh, just like talking to people in Biloxi after Katrina, sure. that, that everything they knew had been washed away, and suddenly they were, they were, there was n they couldn't go to school because there was no school. They couldn't go to the doctor because the, me the medical office was wiped out. So this is not a joke. If you, and you look at how close Turkey Point is. You take a look at the, at the heat maps, of the water and the and the growth of the heat from the from the cooling systems, and you think to yourself, "Hmm, this can't be right. It's only 20 miles from my apartment." Um, and uh, what 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 are the possible consequences? I don't know, but I think that's actually where I think the next uh, area of investment for Knight Foundation uh, is going to be in getting. Miami Waterkeeper, uh, getting the Everglades Foundation, bringing Aspen Institute to do their climate conference here. And I have, I promise you, I have no solution for any of this. But until we get, until we get people forcing our political leaders, because the fix is all going to involve government-sized money, which is you know, huge numbers. It's not foundation money. It's not individual money. It's government size money. Until we get people who have to have positions on uh, on environment, we're not going to even begin. I think um, to figure out what the what the policies are going to be. The science might be there, uh, but the but the people who who mold the will of the people are not are not now uh, obligated except for maybe the mayor of Miami Beach, I don't think there's another politician in our county that needs to take, that needs to take a position on an environmental issue. You have to take positions on housing, transportation, uh, uh, race relations, you, 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 DEI, you name it. These are all things that you like it, don't like it, whatever, but you have to, you have to be able to talk about those things. To get elected, you do not, in my view, have to talk about the environment, and yet it's an existential threat. That's right. one of the things we've been leaning into a lot, though, is seeing that around entrepreneurship and building a climate yeah. tech community where people are building those net zero companies of the future. Um, okay, so by the way, as you're talking about the arts community, um, talking, it, it sounds like one of the things you talked about in, in addition to digital, in addition to highlighting the issues around environment and, and climate, um, in terms of gauging across the community. And oftentimes, one thing that adopt people don't connect is you think about a movie like Moonlight, right? It's on the list of, you know, 100 best movies ever made, oftentimes. And here, Terrell McCraney is the, is the person who wrote it, and Barry Jenkins directed it, both from Miami. And so finding more and more ways to connect across the community in terms of engaging and giving opportunity in the arts. So is that hearing you correctly? But, but if you don't have, if, if artists can't afford to live here, if the back office of a you know, if the, the industry requires an awful lot of people you've never heard about, uh, they, they've got to be able to make a living and to, and to provide uh, for their families. Also, artists are going to go where 
you know, where where the other artists are, where other people are are yeah. are breaking ground, um, and we've got to be able to attract, I think, a uh, a maker community uh, mm -hmm. in in the arts, I, and I think in music. I think one of the great contributions of the late and I, in my view, truly lamented. Florida Philharmonic was the fact that we had, what, 90 musicians uh, who lived in our community who uh, suddenly had no jobs. Um, I think having that kind of opportunity is important and they then go and teach in schools and they, uh, they're your neighbors and they invite you in and they, and I, I think it's all part of, a, of an ecosystem. All right, I'm gonna ask one more question and we're gonna open it up. Okay, so please be thinking uh, of your questions. And, uh, and, uh, and as we wrap up, I have one to, to close with you. Um, but let's talk about philanthropy. Number one, we're seeing different forms of philanthropy. You know, Knight Foundation, uh, I say this as someone who's there, was there for six years, is a traditional form of philanthropy, a big endowment, and we give out you know, X number of dollars every year. We're seeing spend down foundations, where a whole bunch of money is then is is set aside and then spending it fairly quickly. We're seeing stuff at the really grassroots level, uh, things like Give Miami Day, where we're trying to turn everyone into a philanthropist. Um, and then amid all of this, of course, Miami, uh, as has been happening for quite a long time, but we saw a big jump during COVID, is seeing new wealth here. Things like, you know, Griffin Catalyst, you know, with now Citadel being here and Ken Griffin. You know, as we think about a community's future, how it leverages philanthropy and encourage, identifies things for the community to philanthropists to rally around, um, and how it engages with uh, philanthropists, how uh, it enables more of them across the community, is really important. How do you think that we should be thinking about this as we think about the Miami of the next 10, 20 years? Well, I, I, I think, uh, first of all, I don't think of Knight as a, as a traditional I thought you would push back philanthropy, that. Yeah. Uh, because, because <laughs> traditional philanthropy is charity. Um, and uh, it is, it is the, the act itself of giving is the end. I, 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 I think of this as a venture capitalist. 10%, right. maybe 15%, of my relationship with an, with an investor and with an investee, I guess you'd call it, uh, with the business that you're going to invest in is in the preparation and in the decision to make the investment. And then 85% of the rest of the time of that relationship is me helping that business be more successful than even we planned for. Um, and that, it seems to me, is the way to do uh, I'll call it professional philanthropy. You spend 10, 15% of the time setting it up, you make the grant, and, and then the rest of your time as a program officer uh, is helping that organization succeed uh, in whatever ways you can, whether it's bringing them to making connections, helping them in your network, making additional grants. But it is. It is a continuing relationship, and the model, it seems to me, is venture capital. <laughs> um, I, I don't, and, and, and I'm not telling you that a whole lot of people believe that, yeah. um, but I do. Uh, I, I do too. The, the, uh, for the rest, it seems to me that, yeah, all of these things are, are entirely possible. I mean, give Miami was. Uh, give, uh, giving Day was something that I'd heard of in, in they started it, I think it was in Minneapolis or something like that. And I had breakfast with Javi Soto and yeah. I said, I heard about this thing. What, what's the matter with you? You don't, you don't have this. And in, in our, in so I gave Javi the idea. I didn't wow, give I him the it. idea. I didn't give him the idea. Minneapolis uh, did. And, uh, but I, I did chide him for, for being asleep at the switch. And, and I, he said, well, you know, maybe we'll take a look at it. I said, well, you know, a really effective leader of a 
philanthropic organization would have this done by the fall. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, he took that poll and ran with it. Yes. And, 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 I mean, this was this was the best prod I think I've ever I've ever I've ever uh, done. Javi's now CEO of Denver Foundation. And was, and, 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 and uh, the, the millions and millions of, of dollars that are collected. It's creating opportunity is. Uh, is is really all that that is make it easy make it easy for people to uh, uh, to do the right thing for the rest I think you know organizations like this and others ought to be uh, constantly pitching opportunity pitch opportunity because if you try to tell somebody what to do with their money whether it's a foundation or whether it's uh, an individual or anything else they have other priorities. So I, I'm even on, for example, on journalism. I, I'm always careful to say, I know your priority is education, but if nobody knows what the issues are, you're not going to get very far. If somebody walks in at a community foundation and says, "I the lake is polluted. I want to create a donor advised fund to clean up the lake." The first thing you ought to ask as the, as the community foundation is, how'd you find out? Mm. How'd you hear that the lake is polluted? Oh, well, I saw this report or I read this thing and, uh, or it was on my Facebook feed or something. Fine. So there's some information system that is telling you this. You then figure out what to do. You do the politics and the technology of cleaning up the lake. And then the real job is, how do you consistently inform all of the people in the community about the value of a clean water lake? Um, and you are, if you, so if you're really in this for the long haul, then you're in it to inform community in a democracy. You're in it to inform community so people are able to continue to be intelligently engaged. I would not waste my time wringing my hand saying, here's what I think. Ken Griffin ought to do, or or Knight Foundation, or anybody else. Um, but I'd pitch opportunity all the time, uh, and I'd pitch it as broadly as as I know this crowd could, because you all, I, I, I know many of you, and I and I know how different uh, your your interests are. I think um, there are plenty of opportunities to, uh, to to go around. And one of the things that I have loved about Miami from the beginning. I used to be in New York, and New York is about power and money, and and it's really it's 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 huge. It's a it's a, it's a whole set of many many different communities. Miami is too, just not as big. I loved about being able to come to a town where what you had to do was say, "I'll I'll do it, I'll do it." Uh, nobody nobody uh, said no. Right. Uh, Jay Molina started this whole thing. He did. And even when they did tell him no, he still he still. Uh, well, he started at the Chamber of Commerce, was, was kicked out of that, right? And then was, Beacon Council he was, kicked he was it out. Un just like I'm going to be booted to the sidewalk. He was, <laughs> he was unceremoniously. And he has lived on. And it and it has lived on. Yeah. It has lived on. So let's do some questions. Um, we've got, we'll go to Cyrus right here. I think Amy's got a mic and we'll, we'll work our way around to get to everyone. By the way, here's a transplant uh, from Palo Alto, actually, to Miami during COVID. Cyrus, sorry. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks much for the invitation. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about um, some kind of uh, elephant in the room, uh, which is generative AI, right? And what uh, Yuval Noah Harari calls the the end of truth. Um, I, I've co-founded one of the first um, uh, unicorns into that space, uh, stability AI, and I'm still very active in the space, but also active in policy, uh, finding safeguards. I know you've helped uh, the Berkman Land Center uh, come around that and looking at solutions around it. I'm very interested to see what the Knight Foundation is uh, is doing, what kind of work, what kind of research, kind of solutions you're trying to develop and uh, bring forward. Um, thank you for for uh, for bringing it up because it is you know it is an, it is huge, uh, and it's a, and it and it will affect everything everything. The first thing we did was in uh, the, the the Chat GPT the first version. Uh, that was made public was made public I think in November our first training session at night was in January 
um, trying to train our staff on how to use it to try to begin to get some basic elementary understanding. I think that's still essentially where we are many training sessions later because every time you turn around there's something else. It continues to be, it continues to, to evolve. I don't think we've seen anywhere near, uh, anywhere near the, the, the full capacity of it. So what we've done is to fund, for example, the American Journalism Project um, that has stood up now, I think about 40, two or 43 online news operations. We've funded uh, and encouraged their use of uh, generative AI in, in their journalism. Uh, you can say, oh no, that's not, that's not journalism. That's the machine saying it was whatever. Yeah, okay. Did it get the facts straight? Yeah, it did. Uh, did it write better than some of the writers? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and and in fact, in one of the best training session we had was where the guy, a guy in our on our staff, who is not a native English speaker, this is Bernardo, said, uh, I I looked at our our job posting in San Jose, and I put it through ChatGPT. This is an early ChatGPT even. Um, uh, they, I put it through and. And they and ChatGPT gave me a much, and actually it really was a much better written uh, job description. And then, uh, and then uh, I submitted a letter. I wrote a letter saying I want to be a candidate for that job. And then I asked ChatGPT to to edit it. And then I asked ChatGPT to make it sound like I had a PhD. And I realized <laughs> that wasn't it. And then he then he sort of brought it back down. And I said, well, so you're telling me that I should be happy that somebody can now fool me more effectively. And he said, no, you should be happy that you've hired somebody who knows how to use the tool. Uh, and I thought, hmm, OK. Uh, this, is the, this, is, uh, this is going to take some doing. We've had challenges like this as, 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 uh, as uh, people uh, all the time. I mean, the, the, I know it's, it may seem silly to you to, to compare this to the printing press, uh, but before the printing, before Gutenberg mechanized the Chinese invention of the printing press, there was order because the monks would illuminate one Bible a year only certain people were given the book. The cardinal would put his imprimatur, it was always a hymn, would put his imprimatur, and there was truth and order. And then after the, the, the mechanization of the printing press, uh, any Tom, Dick, or Martin Luther could mimeograph uh, whatever they wanted. And people at the time, read Elizabeth Eisenstein, she was a scholar at the University of Michigan who did uh, who, who did a lot of work on this, the, the complaints and the fears were exactly the same. They were the, too much information, too fast. How do we manage this? How, how, do you, how do you distinguish wheat from chaff? How do you s distinguish truth from, uh, from falsity? One of the earliest grants we gave was about 12 years ago to Tim Berners-Lee, who was the actual inventor of the World Wide Web. He wanted he wanted to figure out how to write code that would determine truth or falsity. We didn't, but that, but that led to some early work in identifying source as the beginning of that sort of identification. We funded lots of fact checking, I'd say, I'd say maybe, I don't know, eight or nine different fact checking uh, operations that, uh, that are doing that. And I think I think the stance you need to take is let bring it on. Let's let's see how I use it in my business. Uh, let's see how um, uh, how it helps. Let me let me look at what the pitfalls are. Let me understand it better. Um, and until we do that, um, we're we're just going to be at the mercy of somebody who really does understand it better and can uh, put his hand in my pocket. Let's go over here. Suzette, why don't, why don't we go right here? Hi, this was, this was lovely. Um, the, the phrase that stuck in my head that you said was feed the middle, and I think that's the big challenge in Miami 
which is full of silos, individual agendas, and thinking through your Knight Foundation experience, I feel like there's kind of a story arc of investment in the arts feeds the soul, investment in tech feeds the mind, and now there's this pivot into climate, which is sort of the body piece. So how do you... That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be surprised. They read that. They read that. Well, former journalists, so it, it, there, there you go. Um, how do you take the work and the value brought through those different spheres of influence and carry it forward into this next phase, or how should Knight be looking at that? Look, I, I, all of these were really not... They, 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 I really hadn't thought of it in those ways. Um, and I also hadn't thought of it as, as that segregated. We started the arts program in community. We started it because I, I felt that, that we had such an issue. When, when I first came here in 95, at a meeting of the, of the chamber, at a meeting of the Beacon Council, uh, the issues would be crime and transience. Um, and I thought with, with time, and that had come down already from the, the cocaine cowboy uh, uh, period of time, but, uh, but it still was in the psyche. It still was a, was a, was a fear. And the transience was absolutely a, a, a major issue, and people, uh, I, People who were, were who had lived here for years were incredibly successful. Had built up uh, funds for when they returned to Cuba or when they well returned to to uh, uh, to Venezuela or wherever they were going to return uh, return to. But it was always to return to. Time passes, new generation, um, and I thought we needed to do something that was that took it, that that had a, a low common denominator, and one was sports, one was environment, one was public education, and one was art and culture. They wouldn't let me buy the Marlins, um, which is what I really wanted to do. Forget all this other community stuff. I just wanted to own, own the baseball team. That didn't, that didn't work. Uh, environment was, a, was a, just an almost impossible story. Uh, it's so slow that unless your streets start to flood, People just have a hard time uh, paying attention to it. Now that streets are flooding, people are ready to pay attention to it. Um, but that was then. This is now. And uh, and I don't know if any of you remember Rudy Crew, who was, I do. I thought, one of the most straight-talking uh, political leaders and education leaders that I've ever uh, met in my life. Told, it just laughed out loud when, when I said we wanted to reform education. <laughs> he said, I could swallow your endowment and you wouldn't even notice it uh, in a year and a half. Uh, and I'm not even uh, talking about what might happen in the next union contract. And he said, it's not, you, you're not going to be able to do it at your scale. You can try to do things on the edges, which we did with him. Um, but, and so that, so I ended up with something that would bring people together. That my my thought was, your your toe taps when you listen to Gloria Stefan sing. Your soul soars if 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 he plays Beethoven six, and you're you you're moved when you see a painting that that somehow uh, speaks to you, or you read something that. That, that you thought was it's something you felt, something in coit, something you hadn't really managed to articulate, uh, or you go to a movie, and but all of it is, a, is kind of like a community uh, thing. And when you have that shared experience, you begin to create the Miami of our dreams, the Miami that does, in fact, uh, include everybody, um, that does, in fact, uh, allow people uh, to be themselves, and uh, and that we get over the the old Dave Barry line. He was I, I don't know how many of you, you guys remember know Dave, Dave Barry, Barry. <laughs> but he he wrote one time in the Miami Herald, "There are no bad drivers in Miami," which I thought was a fairly bold statement. And I said because it's just that we all drive according to the traffic rules of our native country, um, and so th so this is 
this is the issue uh, about inclusion that we were talking about before. Uh, but I think looking in all of those areas for community, whether it's whether it's soul, mind, heart, looking for community, uh, I think is what um, is 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 the way to success in in transforming us into a better into a better time. So we're getting close to time. I know we have a lot of questions, so we'll go right this here and then we'll come over to the middle. Zach here, who introduced himself. <laughs> Great. Well, how are you, Simon? Simon from Career Source. If anybody needs a card, I've got one here. But this is wonderful. Thank you very much, um, Opportunity Miami. Something that you said really struck me. I'm, my background is television, television advertising more specifically. Um, and you said something about hitting the middle. And you know, one of the things with the advent of social media and all the things that are going on here, television, news, and, 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 and uh, journalism, who's leading whom? And, and that's the thing that really drove me to mm. kind of move to do something here with the community and, and, and career source. But, who is leading whom in, turn of, of, in terms of the news leading the people or the people leading the social media? Who's leading whom? Uh, it's a, an impossible question to answer in, in, uh, in 25 words or less. I, I, but but here's, here's what, I, what, I, what I was saying. We each have, any of us who have a platform, have a responsibility uh, to be as 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 accurate and as contextual uh, as we can be, it's the it's the fact, uh, 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 the the full accurate contextual search for truth. If a survey that we funded and we have funded from Ipsos from uh, Gallup shows lefties say this, righties say that, and then there's an equal or often larger group in the middle, and we don't report that. We're, we're not only not leading, I think we're misleading by going for the clickbait of left is this and right is that. Um, or more recently, and I think what that leads to is a commu our communities that not only are getting further and further apart, I'm sure you've all seen the Venn diagrams of votes in, uh, in, the, in the Congress and in the Senate yes. that used to have um, uh, red and blue and purple, and now there's no purple. Um, there's the separation, but there's also a, 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 a something that's new with, for me, which is the people who believe that if you don't agree with me, uh, you're evil. You wish ill on the country. And so that, and I think that's a direct result of getting used to a, a news ecosystem that begins with opinion, that begins with your chin out, that begins with telling you, this is what I believe, forget about uh, the facts first, this is what I believe. And, and it's an argument, not, um, not, a, uh, uh, not, a, not an information. Who's leading whom? Uh, we, are, it, we are so fractioned at this point um, that I don't, think, uh, I don't think there is an answer to that. Uh, there certainly isn't in the way that even 30, 40 years ago it was. It was clear um, the the ownership of a new the the editor and publisher of a newspaper uh, had um, a responsibility that showed up also in the evening television broadcast. Um, I remember the, the the news meetings in many television. Uh, stations began with looking at what had been published in the paper that day. Um, that there was, and there was a, there was a more traditional yes, sense. Well, yeah, you know, you know we, we can wring our hands and say, "Oh, that was better." I don't know if that was better. That still put those papers and those TV programs still put women baking the the the, the, the in the in the baking section. Uh, the the vast majority of employees. Uh, were men uh, there was and don't think that doesn't that makes a difference it makes a difference when somebody goes to write an algorithm even algorithms have parents and it's the person who decides um, what what I'm going to put into the algorithm you may try to be as impartial as you can but you're still human when Google I remember when the first time I heard about this this is years ago um, somebody told me put in beauty into Google and go to images, and it's and it was uniformly young white women 
that's beauty. According to the 22-year-old guy in Palo Alto who was writing the algorithm. And, and the response from the, from the platforms was, well, we don't edit. And I said, okay, you don't edit, but you, it's the algorithm. That, okay, and who, who's the parent of the algorithm? There are so many parents right now. There are so many ways to lead that I, I think we, we have to accept uh, that we are in this small d democracy of, of leadership, and we still have time uh, before, um, before it, before it uh, I think, before it's clarified. The one, the biggest difference, of course, between the example I gave you uh, from the Middle Ages to now is that in the Middle Ages we couldn't blow ourselves up. Um, and so the stakes are higher. Uh, <laughs> but as ever, as you have always said, you're a prisoner of hope. I am. And yes. And up to, why don't we go, uh, we have, we've got to wrap up in just a second. So why don't we go quickly, uh, we'll go Zach, Adriana, and then Walter very quickly. If we can just try to yeah, be concise. I'll make it a quick question. Yes. Um, so my team and I, we work to develop entrepreneurship in frontier markets where, you know, business cultures are very underdeveloped. And I admired a lot about what you said about developing a Miami tech culture, whether it's bringing down, you know, more engineers and really creating that business climate. How could, like, some lessons that you have that can be replicated in other markets, you know, for example, markets that are recently opening up like Cuba, where my team and I have just opened our new venture? Oh, well. Uh, well. You're in Puerto Rico and from Cuba, so this is, and you were there for the opening of the embassy, so you can speak to that question. <laughs> <laughs> the, the opening of the embassy that is, that is now not doing much business. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know that, there's, that I have an easy answer for you. I think, I think uh, uh, our approach, our approach was, was much more of a, of a shotgun approach that said we're not taking sides, we're not, we're not making, we were not making investments in individual businesses. We were uh, investing in, uh, it sounds old fashioned to say it now, in co-working spaces. There weren't co-working no, yeah. spaces. We launched the lab. Uh, yeah. the, we, were, we were investing in, we paid the, a third of the budget to Endeavor. Uh, so they would actually come down here. Um, we sold it as coming to a foreign country. Remember, we went we did up, indeed. We went up and sat at Edgar Bronson. I said, no, okay. we, we, don't, we only work internationally. I said, listen, I've got two communities that are just the same, Miami and Detroit, and we'll pay a third of the, of the, of the budget. And, he, and they said yes. Uh, and that was, that was uh, Matt's idea. And, uh, and we brought in 500 startups, and we brought in Black Tech Week, and we brought in Girls Who Code. And the idea was to work double time with smoke and mirrors to create a sense of a, of a community. And so then to see what, what I think has happened, and we, I, I apologize for saying it this way, but we were amazingly lucky that COVID hit and sent uh, <laughs> just a talent that would have taken uh, that would have taken decades, it seems to me, to ultimately build. So to sit here and say this is the direction to go in, I think you're going to be much better at that than I am. To say this is this is an investment. What I do think is that as a community, um, we should not forget that it's about the money. Uh, that uh, I had a conversation with a with a person at, at, in a in a position of political power, and I said, "Look, I was talking at a at a dinner with a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs, and and the guy said he was he was thinking of expanding, and I said, "Well, where you're going to expand, and where?" And he said, I, "I don't remember. It was something like." Provo and Denver, or something like that, and I said, "Why would you do that when you're here and you're?" And he said, "Well, because they're helping me with a facility, and in they're they're going to do something for me." And the, and the response from our politician was, "Oh no, everybody wants to come to Miami, uh, and uh, money is not the issue." And I said, "Money is always the issue. Uh, money is always the issue if you're running a business." And I actually. 
I really think money is the issue of you running a not-for-profit. Yeah, you've got a different mission and commerce balance, um, but if you're not sustainable, you're not going to be independent. So as a news organization, who needs you if you're not independent? If I can own you as a foundation, if the mayor can own you, uh, if the advertiser can own you, then no, you're not, you're not the fourth estate that I want. And the same, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be able to tell uh, the arts organization, God forbid, I should tell you what to, uh, to I should tell Michael Tilson Thomas what to play. Um, or for that matter, my, my good friend Alex in the back, see, he would, he would, I can't tell you what he would say to me. Uh, exactly, yeah. What he has said to me when I've given him really good ideas. Uh, so I think, I think, uh, I think our, the job of a, an organization like this is, is more in the creation of community and creation of an atmosphere that's, that is welcoming, that is inclusive, that says how can, I mean, the mayor's tweet, if it was his, uh, it wouldn't have worked if, if there hadn't been a lot of ground already seated when he tweeted, how can I help? If there hadn't been some way to respond when people say, would say, hang on, I am interested, let's have a conversation. Uh, so I think that attitude should continue um, in or should, should drive organizations like this. By the way, that, as a CEO, you've employed that. I mean, you would, you would let, I mean, when you said, you know, I know in my case, you just let me run. Yeah. Go get them and run as fast as you possibly can. And it feels like I did you know, ask a lot of questions. You did, but I you didn't did. say no. <laughs> Absolutely. Adriana. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for being such an inspiring systemic leader to this community. I know you said to Matt that he didn't work for you, but uh, organizations are made of people. And if it weren't for your leadership, being systemic and tapping into the key areas of journalism, arts, and entrepreneurship and philanthropy all together and seeing the emergence in the edges and connecting and weaving it, we wouldn't be here in this room, you know, just happy with everything we see. I moved here in 2015 and I found this vibrant community and I decided to make it my permanent residency. CEO of GE Brazil. And uh, a small <laughs> uh, B Corp founder now. And um, my question to you is, I know you're retiring, but we, we definitely need to continue to tap into this wisdom. So how can we continue to weave the future with you after you step down? Well, that's nice. Well, first question. of all, you forget about it. I really believe in change. I, I kicked myself off the board of Knight Foundation uh, four years ago because we have a we have an age limit. I reached the age limit and I said I'm out. I'm I'm, I'm off the board. Uh, fortunately, we didn't have an age limit for the staff. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, like I said, it's always about the money. Um, but the but so so uh, I appreciate what you say. Uh, I I think. Uh, I think the the thing that makes me uh, the things that make me so excited about Miami is when I've mentioned several times meeting with with uh, groups of entrepreneurs. Your question uh, and your your t the, the the number of people who are doing uh, interesting things that would have been simply not even not even thought about uh, uh, back. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, I think is really exciting. I think Miami, as a matter of the, the demographics, uh, is evolving in a, in, a, uh, in a way that brings us to a kind of tipping point uh, with, I don't know, I, I used to be, uh, in a previous incarnation, I used to work at a bank, and I was in charge in, of uh, in private banking in Hartford. Mm -hmm. Um, before 99% of the people here were born. Um, and, uh, and one of the things we were always very conscious of were the differences between the wealth creators and the wealth preservers. And, uh, and, the, and the, the mentality, the, different, uh, the difference in the mentality of the, of the wealth creators. Um, and I remember having, when I came here, having a conversation with Florence Hecht, may she rest in peace, 
uh, Florence Hecht, whose name is on, I don't know how many buildings at the University of Miami, who ran the dog track, who had all the money in the world. I said, she was helping, uh, I was chair of the Philharmonic at that point, and uh, she was helping me on some campaign, and I said, Florence, you know, really effective fundraisers give first, and then they're able to say, I did it, so I want you to, and she said, and I, she said well, what are you saying? And I said, well, I think, I think you ought to give more. And she said, I can't give more, I'm on a fixed income. <laughs> and I thought, that, that's, that's the mentality of the rich person, the really, really, really rich person who remembers when she didn't have any money. That group of people made a ton of money and is, has died or is about to die in Miami because of the nature of the development of this city. There is a whole group of people that, that is about to leave really significant uh, fortunes to a second generation that is, that is different, that has a different attitude. And then we've got the, the, all of the tech people who are the wealth creators. So don't confuse them with the folks who have been, who have the, the traditional money, but who are turning over the businesses uh, to their sons and daughters. That's different um, in, in Miami. This is a story the Miami Herald should be doing at least every other week, <laughs> just saying. Um, but it, it is, it is um, I, 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 find, I find real hope in that kind of change uh, and in the kind of change that, uh, that's represented in this room. These are, this, this is a group of people who wouldn't have gotten together in the first place because there would have been a much smaller group. It would have been focused just on how do we entice somebody with a tax incentive to come down to Miami or so, and, and, and as opposed to a group of people whose, whose common thread is how do we build a community we all want to live and thrive in. Let's go to Walter real quick, and then we will, we, we, we've, we've got to run. Um, just want to keep you all on time, your respectful time. Walter. Wait, is there a microphone for Walter? I know we're <laughs> recording this. Oh, it's not a problem. Um, I want to echo what Adriana said and uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Um, I particularly appreciate your comment regarding Miami being the meeting place and that we shouldn't be tapping our backs on that. And um, Matt will attest that I've been a big proponent of human capital to the mayor of Miami instead of capital of capital. I wanted to bring forth the educational component and add, if you will, one factor to that multivariate equation, which is DEI, which is cognitive diversity. My question to you is, can Miami become the meeting place of ideas? And by that I mean, uh, on the back of a fantastic event last month at the World Strategic Forum, which Carlos and Villarrocillo hosted, we had four former Latin American presidents, more than five you former ambassadors and governors of states, and Mario, Mario Vargas Llosa, in fact, was given a prize. Can we one day aspire to again be the meeting place of ideas, noting that currently we have a meeting in New York happening at the UN where we have the Russian ambassador creating, let's say, stirring the pot, and yet here in Miami we can't host the Summit of the Americas. Can we focus on that middle ground again, the idea of cognitive diversity, to one day aspire to become the meeting place for ideas, and it goes in line with education because at the end of the day, if you can have a dialogue, then you can almost eradicate, if you will, that politicization and the fragmentization of society and really focus on what makes people come together. No, really well said. I, I, uh, and my, for me, the answer is I, I see no reason why not. Um, but I also don't think that that uh, it will necessarily happen in the same way as it happens in Washington because it's the capital or in New York because it's where, where the, the financial center is. Uh, it will happen in some way that I think ought to be natural to Miami. Um, we have had many instances of conferences uh, like the ones you just said. We had a phenomenal conference at, at New World about two weeks ago of people who are, uh, some 300 people who were uh, from around the country who were working in digital media and, and the arts. And the place to meet 
is uh, what the logical place to meet was, in fact, Miami. These things will build, and they'll build uh, over time. I think we haven't talked about education, uh, which I think is still is a is a major major uh, weakness um, in in our in our community structure. We haven't talked about race, which nobody should pretend um, that uh, that that's not a that that's not a major issue. We haven't <laughs> talked about poverty, um, which is a, a real issue. We can't have um, a, uh, a the kind of community that you're talking about, where we still have um, people who live, uh, you know, a mile from the ocean and have never been there, um, who are and are and are who are just not in, sufficiently educated by the public education system that we have um, to make them prepared for this for the brave new world. So I think I, I don't I, I I hope you don't I hope you don't mistake my determination to be optimistic, and that's what I mean by being a prisoner of hope. Um, my my, I am determined uh, to look at the glass half full um, to go forward. I'm interested as professionally in funding what I think can work, and we had these discussions early on. My view was let's fund what we think can work and then figure out on ramps for uh, for the rest of the community, there are plenty of there are if, if we could have another whole session uh, on the issues that are the potential obstacles to that, and I think you 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 stated a vision that um, that I think is quite wonderful that I would share, um, and and the kinds of things whether it's environment, race, education, um, uh, poverty, I think those are all. All things, all sticks of dynamite that could um, that could explode and, and ruin it. Uh, so we, as we're trying to build, um, we also need to be cognizant that there are these other things that need to be taken care of. So to close this out, um, and when you arrived, the, the, this was a speech you gave it was last year. You talked about you arrived in 1995, found a city that was either going to split or soar. That we were really at this, that this on the brink in many respects, at a crossroads. Obviously, we soared for lots of different reasons, and now you talked about that um, the opportunities in front of us, which has come from a lot of great work, but also as you talked about a lot of good getting some really good breaks. You know, folks coming here during COVID, things of that nature. But now, sort of, what's in front of us is ours to lose. Um, as we think about the, you know, at the outset, I said, you know, this whole effort with Opportunity Miami is trying to think about that future we want. As we think about the, the Miami of 2040, when many people here drop their kids off at school and thinking about that Miami that they'll find when they're ready to enter the workforce, what do you hope it is that that Miami of 2040 um, that we'll all find? You know, just two things. One, one, first of all, I don't think it's ours to lose. I think it it came so fast that we shouldn't get comfortable. I yeah. think you should always be uncomfortable. I think you should always assume that these guys can move anywhere they want, any day they want, uh, and they won't even say goodbye. Uh, not, I don't mean you. But <laughs> so I'm still up north. Okay, <laughs> they're, they're up for grabs, and 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 it and so nobody get comfortable. You, this is a this is a constant, constant, constant issue, and the and the various things that we just talked about uh, are are things that could always still explode. Um, I I remember when uh, the whole Elian Gonzalez saga occurred, which wasn't that many years, I mean, it was a while ago, but not that many years ago. I don't think the leadership of Miami was in any way prepared uh, for what happened. You were publisher at the time. I was, I was just, just yeah. re relatively new as publisher. Um, and I think, um, and I think one of the things that I, 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 that really struck me is how the business leadership of the town was was so as entrepreneurial as it was was so unconnected forget about with with each other but with the street as as a relatively new guy who was involved with reporters who were on the street all the time 
I felt I had more access to what was happening and why people were demonstrating and why the town was was split in the way um, that it was than many many of my my friends uh, who were very successful business people in a very very narrow lane. I think the fact of organizations like this uh, that have become uh, so much broader that entertain uh, issues that are that are uh, that are that go deep uh, into uh, other not just uh, business areas. I think is a uh, bodes well for uh, for the city. But I, I mean, I I think of a of a place where we continuously, continuously are running as if we're losing. Mm -hmm. I, I never think of 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 uh, that it's mine to lose. We run as if we're losing. And we are constantly having to serve uh, who needs to come here and how, who, who needs to be educated, what do they need when they get here, um, and, and to not forget um, the, in, the, in, the, in the phenomenal diversity that we have. Uh, we have you know, three quarters wonderful things and then one quarter some pretty awful, I don't know what the percentage is, but some, <laughs> some portion pretty awful stuff um, that, uh, that, that you simply can't ignore uh, and shouldn't ignore. And if you do, that's when you really will lose it. Let's thank Alberto Bogan. Thank you.